Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Teaching with Streaming Video, Understanding Instructional Practices, Challenges, and Support Needs, which is sponsored by ProQuest, part of Clarivate. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Uh, all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or the video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers and to submit any comments. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we're ready to get started, so I will hand it over to Kathleen. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Kathleen McClellan. I am the Product Marketing Manager for Streaming Video at ProQuest, and I'm happy to introduce to you today our two presenters. Uh, first off, Ruth McDougall, who is an analyst at Ithaca SNR, where she works as part of a team exploring technological, cultural, and political changes that shape the production and circulation of scholarly knowledge. As she mentioned, she is based here, based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And joining her um, from the ProQuest site today is Sarah Brennan. Um, she is the lead product manager for video at ProQuest. Um, her background is in libraries with a master's in library science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I think I'm supposed to say go Badgers here at this point. And um, she's been building and uh, the product manager for academic video online for quite some time. Uh, she's based in New York City. And then I'm going to be popping in towards the end to help uh, monitor the Q&A. Uh, we do expect this to be a, a lively discussion, so please pop in your questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll get to as many of them as possible. Um, at this point, I'll just go ahead and hand it over to Ruby so she can take it over. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, it's great to be here and to have the chance to share some of our findings from our recent report, Teaching with Streaming Video, Understanding Instructional Practices, Challenges, and Support Needs, which we published in January of this year. The report came out of an Ithaca SNR project um, that was designed to better understand how libraries can maximize the benefits of streaming purchases for faculty and students. And I'll start by giving a brief overview of the project and then delve into some of our findings. So the project was composed of two parts. The first part was a comprehensive national library survey that took place in 2021, designed to provide insight into the streaming media strategies libraries are adopting and the challenges they are facing. The final report from the survey um, was, pu was published in June of 2022 and is available on the Ithaca SNR website. For the purposes of today, I'll mention that one key finding from the survey was that impact on instruction, um, for example, support of the curriculum is the number one factor shaping academic library decision-making in purchasing and renewing streaming licenses. And then the second part of this project and the one I'm focusing on today was a qualitative study of faculty practices and support needs with streaming video. So 24 institutions were involved in this part of the project with 90 librarians participating and a total of 244 interviews conducted covering over 10 collection areas. So today I'll give an overview of some of the key findings that emerged in our analysis of a representative sample of these interviews. I'll discuss findings in the areas of why instructors use streaming, so what pedagogical goals do they hope to achieve using video. 
um, where they find video for, for teaching. And I'll end with discussing some of the challenges instructors face using streaming video. There were five main pedagogical goals that emerged for um, using video. And these goals were largely shared across disciplines with the exception of one, teaching disciplinary literacies, which is sort of more specific to faculty in the arts and the humanities, um, teaching in disciplines like film studies, communications, area studies. The first pedagogical goal, so I'll just go through the five um, briefly. The first pedagogical goal for using video is to reinforce content. And this is fairly straightforward. Um, instructors use video to demonstrate concepts they have addressed already in the lecture and to show how these concepts might be applied or might work in like real life situations. So short clips of movies or shows or documentaries are especially popular for achieving this. Um, a clip from a sitcom to demonstrate an example of a certain family system, for example, or a clip from a movie to demonstrate a principle of international relations. Um, instructors also find that these tend to foster a really good and robust classroom discussion and participation. So the second um, goal is to balance learning modalities. And video is great because it appeals to different learning styles. Um, faculty across the interviews really value it for the way it brings in visual, auditory, and affective modes of learning. Um, however, balance is really the key here. And there was a considerable amount of tension with using streaming because faculty are also concerned about um, using too much streaming video. And so while almost all faculty talked about the value of using video to diversify teaching and learning modalities, they also did express concern for a kind of slippery slope where streaming overtakes um, all other material um, and especially overtakes reading and other skills. So the third um, pedagogical goal is to diversify perspectives. So video is helpful to introduce perspectives that may not be represented in the demographics of the classroom um, or to introduce perspectives from someone with a personal experience of a certain topic. Um, it is also helpful as a kind of a guest lecture. Um, so to bring in an expert um, through video and um, bringing in different kinds of expertise to talk about different subjects. So the fourth goal, uh, and this is closely connected with the previous one, is to enhance cultural and linguistic understanding. Videos can really be uniquely expeditious in promoting intercultural and linguistic competence. So faculty found videos helpful in this regard because especially with um, movies and TV shows and documentaries, these really peak student curiosity um, they introduce students to diverse cultural and international elements, and they often initiate a personal connection to the topic. And this is especially helpful with language learners because students can really become immersed in a world or a narrative and begin to understand the language without even realizing it. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, some faculty use video to teach disciplinary literacy. So faculty in um, subjects like film, media, cultural studies, area studies, um, they teach discipline specific competencies with video. So things like um, elements of a film, sound composition, how editing is used, um, theories of representation. So in these cases, instructors typically frame video as a text um, that they are teaching their students how to read uh, rather than using video to kind of like impart information. So before I move on to discussing where faculty find video, I will briefly mention that while there are many advantages faculty see with streaming, um, some of which are listed here on the slide, um, and the switch to streaming is 
is well underway with most instructors using it almost exclusively. There are some instructors that still prefer Blu-ray or DVD for a number of reasons. Um, and among them is the reliability factor and the quality of recording. So I will discuss those later on when I go over the challenges. Um, but overall, the disadvantages to streaming had a larger impact in faculty on faculty in the arts and the humanities, whose genre preferences are often more difficult to find through streaming. So moving on to where instructors find video. Faculty are always on the hunt for material, um, and they describe learning about and finding material from a number of sources, um, from colleagues, from listservs, from you know, newspapers, podcasts, um, with YouTube and library being the most popular places to actually find the content. I will focus on those two. Um, but before I do, I'll also sort of mention that there are some disciplinary differences that are worth noting. Um, so faculty in STEM are largely able to find most of their content, if not all of their content on YouTube, and rarely, if ever, feel the need to use other platforms. Faculty in the arts and humanities um, also use YouTube and search for content across a much broader array of other streaming platforms, including library resources. So YouTube is perhaps the most um, popular source for streaming content. Many faculty in STEM, as I said, primarily use YouTube and are very satisfied with their overall streaming experience. Faculty described YouTube as easy and fast for everyone and very convenient because of the abundant selection of short clips, um, which are overwhelmingly popular for teaching across all disciplines. The selection of content is also, on, um, as we know, on YouTube extensive and faculty can usually find good or at least suitable material. And sometimes YouTube is really the only place faculty can find some content. Um, for example, clips of old movies or commercials. YouTube is also full of international content um, and can generally be accessed internationally, though copyright and some local laws may, may inhibit this. Um, and then despite its broad popularity, it is not without flaws, according to faculty. Um, so mentioned the issues of commercials playing and problems with algorithm pushing, pushing certain content to students that they wouldn't want um, pushed to their students. Some faculty even described their use of YouTube as emerging out of just necessity, but not really out of preference. And some explained that they, if they had an easier time using and navigating library resources, they would prefer to use the library. So the library um, as a, a place for finding content is less cut and dry for many faculty. So nearly all of the faculty went out of their way to praise the librarians at their institutions. And many faculty who use library resources said things along the lines of, I don't know how I would survive without you. Um, and this quote here, I'm really confident that if there's something I need and I give librarians enough time that they will figure it out. Um, faculty use the library most for accessing feature length films, documentaries, foreign films, classic movies, and anthropological films. But they are confused about the process to access this content and often require help from librarians to be successful. So the search process um, and the ins and outs of the library subscription terms baffled faculty and they expressed confusion about navigating and accessing content through vendor platforms. The selection of available content through the library services can also be limiting to some faculty and some actually encourage students to get a library card from their local library um, because the subscription selection is often more robust 
through the local library than through their institution. And then finally, um, I'll briefly mention Netflix and direct to consumer platforms as fairly minor players in this ecosystem because faculty avoid them unless they absolutely have no other choices. And this is because keeping costs low um, to or free to students is a huge priority for faculty. Across the board, faculty prefer not to assign content from direct to consumer platforms. <clears throat> Instead, um, they try their best to source content from a platform that would not impose additional fees on the students. However, some do occasionally use it, and um, a few justified the additional cost by equating it to the fee of a textbook or something like that. So before I end, I will provide an overview of six of the primary challenges that faculty articulated um, in using video, streaming video. So the first challenge is discovery. And discovery is challenging largely because of the overwhelming amount of content available across the overwhelming amount of platforms. Um, and it makes it difficult for faculty to kind of know where to start and how to sort through the excess to find material that's suitable for them. Um, and this is sort of an interesting irony because despite the seemingly limitless choices that streaming offers, locating some kinds of content, um, namely independent and international content, still requires extraordinary effort. Then the second challenge is uneven access. Um, and this is related to the first. So uneven access is a problem for many faculty who want to use international content, um, experimental or artistic um, content, because a lot of this is not available on streaming platform, on any streaming platform. Um, and then this is compounded further if the international content is outside the mainstream. So independent international content, for example, is very hard to find through streaming. And it's harder even than it was when faculty used DVDs. Um, and so this can be very limiting for some instructors teaching in subjects um, like film studies, area studies, um, ethnic studies, and, and um, foreign language. And the third challenge is um, the challenge of ephemerality or disappearing content. <clears throat> and this is an issue with like all things, right? So faculty describe using a video from a subscription service once, but then finding out that the video is no longer available or things like videos being taken suddenly down due to copyright. Um, there's a general lack of reliability um, that pervades faculty impressions with streaming. And for some, this was a very significant problem. The fourth challenge, um, are, these are sort of technical issues. And these often seem like minor things, but um, things like the sound going out or Wi-Fi not working, um, but the faculty describe these challenges as being some of the most disruptive to their teaching. <clears throat> they also describe not really knowing how to troubleshoot them in real time um, or who to ask. And another issue is that quite a few faculty don't know how to integrate videos um, into their LMS systems or even into their lecture slides. So they had to kind of toggle between tabs during lecture, um, which created a clumsy teaching experience. Um, and I should note here that faculty did not include um, accessibility, the accessibility of content in terms of making videos accessible for students with visual impairments, um, hearing loss, or other relevant needs. They did not note that as a significant challenge. Um, however, many faculty acknowledged, acknowledged that they should know how to make sure their videos are accessible and have accessibility features, but they haven't 
to their knowledge, had students who needed these features. So they haven't learned how to do that. Um, so while accessibility was not mentioned specifically as a challenge by most faculty, I'm flagging it here um, as a challenge because overall faculty were unaware of ways to ensure accessibility for students. Um, and then the fifth challenge, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is, is the challenge of poor recording quality. Um, and this, is a, this was a challenge that was articulated mostly by film studies faculty, but given that they are really among the heaviest users of the library, um, it's an important challenge to note. Basically, they want films and video to, to look and sound like they are supposed to. Um, and they've encountered many streaming recordings that were very poor quality um, and unusable as a result. And then finally, the last challenge that I'll talk about is the issue of copyright. Um, and this is a challenge in large part because faculty just don't understand or know how fair use um, laws work, uh, where their teaching would fit in, and how to manage their really their own expectations um, around fair use in terms of what they understand as possible for requesting videos to be digitized from the library. Um, and this will likely continue to grow as a challenge with international content and copyright laws in flux. So I will just end um, by reiterating that overall faculty are really enthusiastic about using video and streaming specifically because um, of the flexibility in when and where content is viewed the variation it provides to lectures um, and the appeal to different learning modalities, the variety of perspectives it brings to the classroom and the access that it can provide to um, a, a wide variety of genres and authentic content um, like eyewitness videos, home videos, um, cultural practices, et cetera. So um, with that, I will end and thank you for listening and I look forward to um, any questions or comments. Awesome, thank you, Ruby. I think we're gonna move over to Sarah now to do a quick overview of what we've been doing over at ProQuest to help um, <clears throat> kind of address some of these issues as well as um, even though this was all kind of independently done. So Sarah, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, hi everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today. I was really thrilled when I learned that Ithaca was doing this study entirely around how and why faculty use video in their teaching. Um, ProQuest has been offering academic video online as a streaming video resource for use specifically in teaching and learning uh, for the last several years. We were really, early adopters um, in that research and evidence that demonstrates um, that using video in teaching increases learning outcomes, it encourages learner engagement, it really appeals strongly to Gen Z, all, all the things that um, the research that Ithaca did sort of validated. And um, we've for a long time known about all the really innovative and inventive ways that faculty incorporate video into their teaching. Um, and a lot of the examples that Ruby shared were things that we've seen among our own users, you know, for a long time. Um, the specific examples that she gave really resonated, you know, showing a documentary to inspire student critical thinking and encourage discussion, um, showing really practical skills based teaching video. So things like nursing video that demonstrate an IV insertion, um, or even really creative outlets that are also practical training. So thinking of performing arts, um, stuff like dance choreography, or watching actors perform a particular scene, that's all very um, craft practical training. Um, there are lots of ways that instructors demonstrate a really complicated concept. A video can break that down into understandable components and graphics. She mentioned short form, almost explainer type video. So thinking of like a really gnarly chemistry equation or an economics formula. Uh, we know that faculty love to use feature film. It helps make abstract ideas or historical time periods or historical people much more relatable to today's learners. 
um, video adds that sort of visual element to a particular syllabus topic as a supplement to textbook reading about climate change. It's a totally other, more impactful experience to visualize actual footage of ice caps melting or see climate refugees um, in a particular community. Uh, so those are all ways that we know faculty, instructors, teachers use academic video online and have for a long time. Uh, and I wanted to use this time to really demonstrate some of the features, the learning tools that we have on the platform itself in the database that are intended to meet faculty where they are and really assist them in incorporating that video into their teaching and learning. One thing that really resonated um, with the research Ithaca did was about the challenges faculty face in utilizing library resources and kind of connecting those dots between the databases that libraries subscribe to and embedding that content um, into their course material. So I'm gonna share my screen and show um, everyone should be seeing academic video online. You got it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so what I have up on the screen, this is a video of academic video online. Uh, and what I'm highlighting here on the screen are the share options. So for every video, we offer a permalink. If your library is using a proxy server, this is proxied. We also have an embed code so that faculty can embed video as an iframe directly in course management software. We also have an LTI launch URL. Um, we've just upgraded to LTI 1.3. This is a form of single sign-on for students. Uh, so what, we're, what I'm really trying to demonstrate is that we hear loud and clear that faculty get confused by databases sometimes, and we're trying to eliminate those barriers and make it just very easy, one click, for them to grab a video and be immediately using that inside their courseware. Um, let me show some other features too. Let me just one second. Um, so another element that we have available on the platform at all times is a transcript. This transcript is interactive. It really helps with navigation of the video. So again, we want to make it easy for faculty to find and locate parts of video that they want to teach with. So if I search for a keyword in this video, I can immediately navigate right to that spot. Um, let me show that in action. Um, so I can click that and jump immediately to that moment in the video. The and that's important to make it nice and easy for faculty, especially when they're in front of a class and they want to isolate just a particular segment to deliver a very specific learning outcome that's available. Uh, and along with that, we have a clip maker. So we know that faculty often don't, just like Ruby illustrated in the research, they don't always want to show a full two hour video. Maybe they just want to show a short two or three minute segment that's very tailored and tight to a syllabus topic or a specific item. Uh, so the clip maker makes it nice and easy for them to do that. I can click a button uh, and the clip maker is there and I can choose the timestamps I want and assign just that clip. So all of those share options that I had up a moment ago, the permalink, the LTI launch URL, an embed code, those ex all exist for clips just like they do for full videos. And an awful lot of our video, especially our high use video comes pre-segmented, um, particularly for video that lends itself really well to chapterization or segmentation. So again, we wanna make it nice and easy for faculty to do the things that they want to do with the video. Uh, Ruby mentioned accessibility and I was so pleased to hear her say that it is a huge challenge. This is a multimedia resource. We want all of the learning tools to be available to all learners, whether faculty are aware of it or not. Um, those features exist in the database. So the transcript is absolutely an accessibility tool. So are closed captions. We have a bunch of display settings. So if I'm a user and I'm relying on the closed captions, I can make them bigger or change the font color or size. I think sometimes these features are overlooked, especially by people who aren't using these features, um, but they're all there really to assist the learner who needs them. Similarly, the platform is totally responsive to screen readers like JAWS and NVDA and other types of assistive technologies too, voice navigation, keyboard navigation. Uh, so again, if the learner needs those tools, they are there, whether or not the faculty member is totally aware of them. And um, I'm really pleased to share that for the last year and a half or so, we've been offering audio described video as part of academic video online, which is an accessibility tool um, for specifically for the visual impaired, visually impaired. Uh, it's an audio track that describes what's happening alongside the video. So again, we, we really are passionate that this database, this resource and video should be accessible to all users.
Uh, speaking of learning tools, another feature that I think sometimes is overlooked in the database is the playback speed. And I emphasize that because I think we're all obsessed with speeding things up. Um, I am guilty of it too. I like to listen to podcasts at 2x or watch meeting recordings really fast. Um, but the big win for learners is the ability to slow material down. So when a video is particularly dense or they're watching a video uh, as homework help to try and learn some material and it's just going by too fast, that ability to slow it down below 1x is a big win for them. And thinking especially of non-native English speakers, this is also a really key feature um, to help ensure that they're getting the same learning outcome out of that video. Uh, and speaking also of non-native English speakers, I'm going to emphasize too that the entire platform can be translated into for other languages. So that includes the transcript itself, the captions, and also the menu and the, the UI. Uh, so that if English is not my first language, um, I have the option to translate the entire platform and consume the video content that way. It's also useful. We hear a lot from um, educators, professors, instructors of foreign languages um, that it is a help too. So all of those options are there today as learning tools, uh, but I'm really most excited to talk about the newest learning tool, a feature that we just added uh, within the past couple months. We've just launched this into Academic Video Online, and that is the option to make video interactive, to add an interactive learning element right alongside the video. Uh, and, you know, we heard loud and clear that these are things faculty are doing with video already. When faculty show a video in front of a classroom, they're often asking questions, you know, verbally out loud about the video. And when they assign video uh, in courseware, they are um, posing those questions right in the course material too. And so we're really pleased to be offering this feature as a part of the database itself. We really wanna meet faculty where they are, help support them do all this cool innovative work that they are doing when they're teaching with the video. Uh, and you know, we heard Ruby mention like different faculty use video in different ways. Different disciplines use video very differently. Um, some faculty, when they are posing questions or assessments alongside video, they're using multiple choice formats or true false, you know, very um, objective assessments. Others are leaning more towards subjective learning experiences, things like a discussion prompt as a way to activate, encourage um, student expression and collaboration with their peers. Some are using more open-ended questions or polls or just ways to make students more active with the material. Uh, and so when I say that we've added a learning tool that, that offers interactions into our video, that's what we mean. There's a big variety of types of interactivity available for our video. Uh, so let me show what I'm describing. Um, this is an example of a pre-assessment, which is a really common um, pedagogical tool that's used all the time. Not, it's not unique to video, um, but the idea that an instructor will ask their students, assess their students at the top of a new unit or a new syllabus item. We're about to learn about X. What do you already know about it? And then at the end, that enables them to do a post-assessment and see whether or not students achieved the learning outcome that the faculty member was going for. That's one purpose of this tool. Um, but if I'm honest, uh, I think that this tool, uh, the idea of a pre-assessment at the start of a video is just so important for this particular medium. I think we all, not just students, but we all have very learned behaviors uh, about watching video. I know when I'm watching a video at home uh, or television even with my partner, um, for me, that's an opportunity to also be multitasking and texting and I'm answering email and I have my laptop open and I'm doing three things while I'm also watching that video. Uh, and I'm the first one to say, can you please rewind three minutes because I don't know who that person is on the screen or why or how they got there. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. And I think it's only natural that students have that same learned behavior. Um, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that they don't. Uh, so a pre-assessment or some sort of interaction at the top of a video is a really good subtle reminder to the student that now you're engaged in active learning. Now you're going to flip on um, it's a reminder to them that this is an academic assignment. This is different from entertainment video or something that you're doing on your own time. Uh, it's, it's a way to encourage them to be dialed in and focused and concentrating. Um, so that's one type of assessment that's offered. Um, I'm going to fast forward and show another option, which is um, this is more of a fill in the blank a keyword matching of key terms that were used key vocabulary mentioned during the video segment. So here the student is prompted to fill in the blank. Um, 
that's just one other option of a type of assessment interaction that's available. I'm going to fast forward um, and show one more. Um, next week we'll be tackling what is. Bear with me one second. The next one I'm going to demonstrate is a discussion prompt, which is another really very common type of assessment so tool that's crash course study skills in video. Uh, you can see that here. And also, it's not unique to video, I should say. Discussion prompts are a really common way that faculty have been driving student engagement for a long time in courseware. Um, it's a way to encourage natural student expression, but I think also different from face-to-face -face instruction, where there's a high intimidation factor to raise your hand and speak out loud. And honestly, that's not unique to, to pedagogy either. Um, but the idea that you can do that in a non-judgmental way in a discussion forum uh, really frees students up and I think lends itself really well to some things like documentary um, that encourages that encourages students to collaborate with their cohort. Uh, what you can see in this example is that the faculty member has utilized an option that requires students to submit their discussion response before they can see that of their cohort. And I mentioned that because um, some of the um, interaction types that we offer, what we're going for is a very simple, basic way for faculty to dive in. That first one, that pre-assessment was really just a sentence or two that a faculty member or instructor composed there in the designer. Um, but there are a lot of advanced kind of best practices in pedagogy that are part of this tool as well. Uh, here I'm going to show a multiple choice question, um, and I've got the advanced um, options enabled here so that you can see some of them. Uh, one really popular one is to randomize the order answer so that different learners will see the multiple choice options presented in a different order. So that prevents one learner from knowing what the correct answer is from someone else. Uh, I can also enforce that students are not able to fast forward or rewind. So they must respond to this question before they can move forward in the video. And again, that's um, really doubling down on that idea that we want the student, the learner, to be actively engaged with the video interacting doing that critical thinking, that reflection. Uh, in this example too, I have feedback here, something called feedback, which is an element that sort of guides students to the correct answer. So if the learner selects something that's incorrect, instead of just saying, no, that's not right, um, or sort of the faculty member instructor here is providing them some gentle guidance, a hint, a tip, reflect back on something we learned previously to help get them to the correct answer. Uh, so again, a lot of advanced kind of pedagogy instructional design that's built into this tool uh, available for the faculty who want to take that next step and use a lot of advanced features. And again, if, if a faculty just wants to dive in and pose a simple question, that's also an option. These, these advanced features are here for the power user who wants to use them and won't be intrusive uh, to those who just want to get started. Um, and that kind of Again, diving back to Ruby's research um, in the Ithaca study that, you know, diff every faculty does something differently. There are different faculty uh, approaches, different instruction styles. Some faculty want to create all the materials that they use in their course themselves. Uh, and so if a faculty member wants to compose these interactions from scratch, they can do that. We have a very robust designer, but we also know there's some elements of um, faculty behavior that prefer to lean on something that's already created or edit or adjust something that already exists. Uh, so we've got a bunch of templates here to help guide faculty into using this tool um, with some of the really most commonly used pedagogical assessments in video. Uh, that pre-assessment, post-assessment is one I mentioned, a discussion forum, there's a poll, um, there are the option to do a reflective pause. So for a faculty member to say to students at a spot in the video, I'm gonna pause the video here and think back about what you just saw reflecting on X, Y, Z. That's an option. Um, it could be in the form of an annotation, a note that a faculty member places into the video, pay attention to this next scene, uh, thinking about X, Y, Z. Um, if I click to use one of the templates, let me just show you what that looks like. Um, you can see here is the pre-assessment, post-assessment one. So making it very easy for faculty to edit from here, just a button click or two to have created and embedded this interaction into their video. Uh, and then again, for the faculty um, who want to just dive in, the designer is also free form. So they're able to create questions from scratch. Uh, and then a lot of our video, we've pre-created interactions for some of our high use video. And so faculty are totally welcome to use those or create, uh, edit from them, adjust them, 
create, copy, make them their own. So we're trying to um, meet faculty where they are with this tool. Uh, let me stop sharing for a second. Um, I know we want to leave a really healthy amount of time for Q&A and your comments and feedback, particularly on the research that Ithaca did. Um, so I'll just wrap up and say that we're just beyond excited about this feature. Um, we really, we, we built this database and we spend a lot of energy on it because we know that faculty want to use video and teaching and learning and we're so passionate about supporting them and all the great, innovative, interesting things they do with video. Uh, and we just can't wait to hear your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, that was amazing and super exciting to see how um, this research that Ithaca has been doing for the past couple of years really aligns with the work um, that you're doing with Academic Video Online. So we have a ton of questions, um, so I'm just gonna get started. Uh, so one of the questions, I'm going to start with you, Ruby, um, of those interview, interviewed or part of the information gathering for this presentation, was there any difference between small versus large institutions, rural versus city? Um, somebody else also mentioned later on something about community colleges versus universities um, in terms of use or approach to using video. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, there, yes. Uh, there was some difference with um, some rural institutions mentioning, um, so, so some of the interviews actually happened at the start of the pandemic when there, the switch was pretty extreme. And so there were some, um, there was mention of in rural institutions, the difficulty with broadband access and um, just ensuring that if if these, um, if faculty are going to be using video in asynchronous classes, um, or sorry, in synchronous online classes, that there is enough um, broadband access to allow for that. Um, and how to accommodate rural students, um, or students, not even rur just rural, but students that might not have um, enough access to broadband access to, um, to watch the videos. That was not um, enough. Uh, there, it was a small um, percentage of, of um, institutions that, that um, brought this up. So it didn't make its way into the report, but it did um, make its way into conversations at Ithaca. And um, we have been sort of working on perhaps replicating this with community colleges um, and like location specific institutions because there actually is uh, a difference between you know larger institutions and their resources, um, broadband access and community colleges. So the reason why community colleges were not included in this first survey is um, largely a question of just scope and capacity and not um, a question of interest. And we are currently sort of figuring out if it's possible to, to um, do something similar, but with community colleges. Nice, all right, thank you. Um, another question, uh, someone is curious if faculty who prefer to use YouTube, well, and I think you did address this, but anything else that you wanted to add here? Um, Concerns about disappearing content from the platform versus the more reliable persistence of library provided content. Didn't know if you wanted to go into anything a little bit more there. Um, I'll just say that YouTube is also um, unreliable. And yes, that was a big issue with YouTube, but because there's so much available on YouTube that a lot of the um, faculty who sort of just used YouTube were able to find something, maybe not the exact same thing, but something close enough or that could still suit their needs very quickly um, just by you know another search on YouTube. So yes, reliability is a huge factor for YouTube, but not a huge challenge for those who only use YouTube. Got it. Um, Sarah, I think this one might be for you. Uh, do you focus at all on textbook publisher videos 
products uh, provided with courses, textbooks as a video resource. Does that make sense? Um, it does make sense, but I I uh, interpreted that question to be for Ruby. Like, was that part of? Oh, okay, the, go for it. Or was that type of video explored by the faculty you interviewed? Um, not not much. No. Um, so basic the questions um, were were fairly open ended, and so we. Um, identified where they found the video through analyzing the the interviews um, and um, no very few if any mentioned using um, videos associated with textbooks got it all right oh my gosh there's so many good questions in here okay are there strategies, and I think Ruby, your paper did address um, some of these, are there strategies for improving or increasing faculty use of library resources? Um, many of our faculty say they love the library and its resources, but don't actually use a lot of the resources because things like YouTube are easier, even if there is better content that we have to offer. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. So you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yes, sure. Um, right. So we do include um, a list of recommendations for libraries at the end of our report. Um, and this was something that this is this is a really challenging topic because of um, just the capacity in libraries, too. And we need yeah. obviously, you know, when we're thinking about these things, it seems like some of the best um, solutions to these challenges just require the most amount of human labor, um, which is in short supply at many academic libraries. Yep. So um, some things like creating um, sort of like a curated libguides um, list of streaming resources um, and video content sort of like working in video a list of video content into already existing libguides um, could be helpful because one of the things that um, faculty mentioned was that when they are searching for like a topic the video search is completely separate from other materials and so it's hard to so, sort of make it a one one-stop shop even though their classes really do integrate all of these different types of material um, they're searching for the video on its own. So if you integrate a curated list into like a libguide um, by topic, that that might um, increase faculty use. Um, and then the other thing that I'll mention, um, and there's there's a longer list in the report, but um, and, and I think Sarah, actually, your presentation um, was really exciting because of this, is to focus on faculty um sort of upskilling perhaps where they can um really learn the the tools that they need to be able to maximize the video um in their teaching because once they are able to sort of like see the utility of of really experience and see the utility i think that they will um or it sounded through the interviews that they will um be more likely to use the library resources. So um, maybe partnering with like centers of teaching and learning for um, workshops that um, target more specifically some of the technical issues that faculty talked about with um, using video. Um, and then I just encourage um, you to, to, to maybe check out the last part of our report for a longer list of recommendations. Awesome. And I dropped into the chat too for people to take advantage of. Uh, since Sarah was showing academic video on that, I added in our, our lib guide. And we actually have a marketing toolkit that um, libraries can leverage. It's got a lot of content that's already developed in there. And then you can kind of uh, take that and hopefully make that job, because we know the resources are short, um, and make your job a little bit easier there too. Um, another interesting question Did faculty express any distinction between requiring film access like a textbook versus viewing in class versus availability through the library? Did any of that come up? Yes. Um, yeah, so this goes into the um, pretty uniform consensus of faculty not wanting to impose fees for students. Um, 
but some of the few that that said that they they would would be willing to um, just sort of thought of them as if they were it was a textbook fee, but then would also qualify that by saying, well, um, you know, with the streaming fee, they it's not something that they can take for life. This is just like a one time view, and so there was a difference um, with the sort of like acceptance of asking students to pay for something that they that, that they then did not own. Um, mm -hmm. the way they do with the textbook. Um, was that answering the question, actually? I think so. Sarah, anything okay. else that you want to add in there? Um, nothing for that question specifically. Okay. Um, all right. So, Sarah, I'm going to start bugging you a little bit. Uh, do you, so somebody was, um, I think this was when you were showing the different types of uh, functionality that we can share out. Do we feel like fa uh, faculty fully understand the difference between using a permalink, an embed code, or the LTI tool? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I would say that across the board, probably no, they don't all know those differences. I think there's some element of faculty that use the library all the time and are really, really comfortable with those distinctions. and nothing to do with libraries, but there's also some element of faculty that are really power users of video and they're overly familiar with the idea of embedding an iframe or using LTI to discover lots of rich content, not just video. And then there's some element of faculty for whom those concepts are foreign. Um, and I think, yeah, we're, we're always struggling with that too, how to best do that outreach um, and, and help educate faculty about how to get the most, like Ruby was saying, how to get the most out of those library resources. Thank you. Okay. Um, another one for you, Sarah. How consistently high quality are the translations? Is there a delay between the material that is added and when the, tra I, I think maybe this is the transcripts, not the translations. Um, how high quality are the transcripts? And then is there a delay between when we add material versus when transcripts are available? Um, well, I'm going to answer that as though it is about translations, because I did show that. I think maybe that is the oh, question. Oh, okay. Um, All right. And the answer is there's no delay. So the minute we load video, the translation is there. It is pretty accurate. We use third parties to create it. Um, but for the most part, we use local. Uh, well, we use two things. We use a machine learning tool to do the translation, but then we also use um, local, like regional um, experts or labor to help us refine. So they're pretty accurate, but if you if you observe a problem, let us know. We'll be happy to correct something. Um, a question about the interactions. Does faculty do faculty have to create a separate account outside of the school subscription through the library? Um, someone has a faculty member that would be interested in this feature. Cool. Yes, I didn't demonstrate it um, just in the interest of time, but we do have on the platform the ability to create a user profile. Um, that's kind of natural database behavior. And yes, that if faculty want to create and assign interactions, they should create a user profile. Um, and if you want to follow up with us or we can follow up with you to make sure you get the information and training materials to that faculty member, um, just let us know. Cool. Um, what technology is needed to support um, the ProCourse product, which is academic video online? Yeah, we have a help file that we can send over um, that are kind of the minimum um, requirements, technology requirements, but essentially it's just a browser and an internet connection. Um, and I just want to double click on the idea of equity of access. I saw someone mention like their students at home still use dial up and um, one feature I didn't show about the platform, but when a user presses play on a video, the platform will auto detect the bandwidth quality of that user and then adjust up or down so that even if someone is on dial up, um, the platform will sort of load the video for them so that once they press play, it, it will stream um, you know, at the resolution that that dial up connection can support. Awesome. Okay, uh, another, well, this is more of a comment. I think, I, I, and about the um, interactions, I, I believe. I think our instructional designers would really benefit from knowing about these newer features. So that's great, glad we could help out today. Um, knowing that, Sarah, so Sarah, this might be for you. Uh, knowing that content disappearing is a problem cited by many instructors, how does ProQuest limit timing of removal of content during the academic year? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I was listening to that conversation about YouTube and thinking like, you know, library vendors are not immune to that either. We license this content. So we are also um, at times, you know, have the same copyright requirements that YouTube does and a publisher can withdraw material um, and we have to remove it. We do work really, really hard to only remove content in between the North American academic semesters. So that means June, July, like the very end of June, and then the very beginning of January. Um, and we do message that out ahead of time and um, offer the opportunity to secure perpetual access wherever we can. But we certainly feel that um, very acutely that faculty need to be able to rely on this content. It has to be stable or they won't use it. Um, and, and that's a real challenge. And so we, we really take that to heart and do our absolute best to only remove content between semesters and notify in advance so that they have time opportunity to either secure perpetual access or select something else to embed in their course. Thank you. Um, okay, a couple more questions here. Um, someone is asking about Panopto. Uh, we have a video tool called Panopto um, integrated into the learning man management system. Could we upload Avon clips to Panopto instead of using them directly in Avon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the answer, unfortunately, is no, because our licensing agreements with our publisher partners don't allow for any downloading or like external use outside our platform of the content. Otherwise, we lose control of it. So like if you were to upload it to Panopto, then it's as though you've like you've taken that asset and you can do anything with it. Um, so for now, this tool is is just available inside the database itself used on our platform. But it's you're exactly right that like the purpose of this tool is meant to provide that same experience that we know faculty are doing with tools like Panopto and Kaltura and so on. Great. Um, how do the videos work? I'm, I'm assuming uh, the viewing of the videos on handheld devices such as cell phones. Yeah, so we, um, the, plat the academic video online platform is designed to be mobile first, so it just works in a browser, and we actually, um, we design it for browser first and then adapt that for large screen, so it's all um, equal works equally well in, in a handheld, in a mobile or tablet, and one thing we do monitor all the time, um, there was a really great, this is a plug for a different ACRL choice webinar from a a couple months ago about digital natives and today's generation of students. Um, and we do monitor really closely how much of our usage is mobile tablet driven versus desktop laptop. Um, and we're, it's still, you know, overwhelmingly desktop laptop, but we do watch that really closely. And um, we know that that's really learned behavior for a lot of students, even watching video on a mobile device. Cool. All right, one more, Sarah. Sorry, I'm bombarding you. Can faculty use ProQuest, the ProQuest video platform to create their own course specific videos? Um, so we don't, it's not a production. Um, there's no video production element to academic video online. It's, it's all video content meant for faculty and students to watch. But academic video online does come with a free media hosting service. So if you have lecture capture or other videos that you've created, you can upload them onto the platform alongside Academic Video Online. Great. I think I've hit them all. There's a lot in here um, and we are running towards the end. Oh, someone is asking about um, the LTI 1.3 integration for Moodle. Um, so please just respond to the, the, um, the poll that I think just popped up and answer and we'll contact you and then we'll make sure you've got all the information you need there. Um, I think that is it. I, I believe a lot of these questions were kind of asked. Um, so I tried to gather them together. So I think we hit all the major issues. Um, thank you for the great interaction. This is exactly what we were hoping for to make sure your um, inquiries and um, just you know getting a good conversation about this really important uh, content type for faculty and students are addressed. And I'll hand it back over to Sabrina to kind of close it up. Great. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, I'll just echo Kathleen and say thanks so much to Ruby and Sarah for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks to Kathleen for moderating the Q&A. And thanks to our attendees for your questions and comments. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording.
Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. Uh, there's also a quick poll up right now uh, that you can respond to as well. So uh, thanks to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session and hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar.